Hey, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. I'm Cody, I'm one of the pastors here. And before anything else, uh, we need you to hear that we're a no matter church. And what that means is no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or if it's been done to you, 
Uh, we need you to know God loves you and you can look for him here with us. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to clean yourself up to be here. We are just really glad that you're here. If you're new, um, or maybe you've been here for a while and you just haven't taken that step to become known, uh, to get connected here at Prairie Lakes Church, I'd encourage you to take that step here today because connected people are growing people. Uh, when you become known, when you get connected, uh, God uses that in significant ways. So if you are new um, and you fill out that form here today, I'll send you an Amazon gift card just as a thank you. It takes about 30 seconds. And all you need to do is text NEW to 99581. And that's NEW to 99581 and fill out the short form. It only takes about 30 seconds. And the next step that we talk about every week is giving generously. And it's just uh, so cool uh, to see the amount of life change, the amount of impact uh, that we have at Prairie Lakes Church in part due to your generosity. And one of the cool things uh, that you get to contribute to uh, when you give to Prairie Lakes Church is impact across the state and beyond. I was just in a meeting where we were celebrating some of what God has done through Prairie Lakes Church this past season. Uh, we were able to get people connected to the church, for people to become known for the very first time. We had over 800 people take that step this last ministry season. It's just so cool that this is a landing spot for people uh, that no matter who they are, where they've been, what they've done, or what's been done to them, uh, they can walk in and they can get connected here. So if you want to give to Prairie Lakes Church, you can do that online. by going to prairielakes.org forward slash give. You can select your campus from the drop down. We're going to kick to today's message, so let's hear from Pastor Jesse. Hey, happy Mother's Day, okay? Happy Mother's Day. Um, I know we've probably already talked about it in the service at some point, but uh, just in case, okay? Here's my, uh, my uh, one piece of wisdom for you on, on, on Mother's Day. Uh, don't screw it up, <laughs> okay? Uh, make sure today your mom uh, or the uh, mother of your children knows just how much you love them and how much you appreciate them and uh, how grateful you are for them. Okay. Happy Mother's Day. All right. Hey, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. If you're checking us out this weekend and this is your first time here, like if this is like your, like your very first time, um, it really is a great weekend for you to be here. It really is. But it's also a pretty interesting one. Like we may have talked about uh, back in January of this year, Pastor John, our senior pastor of 25 years at Prairie Lakes, um, back in January announced that he was ready to switch seats. Uh, which really kind of meant he was kind of sensing he was ready to transition out of his role as senior pastor and into a different role at Prairie Lakes. Um, and he was ready to hand off leadership to, uh, to someone. Okay. So that was January. Then in March, uh, uh, Pastor John and myself got back up here in front of you. And we announced that our elders were recommending that someone to be me. Okay. So, um, if this is your very first weekend here, if this is, and we have not yet had the chance to meet, hello, my name's, Je my name's Jesse. <laughs> um, uh, so, but for the rest of us, okay. For the rest of us, this news is now a couple months old and, uh, some of us probably sick of hearing it. So, uh, which I get. So, um, since the, since the March announcement, Pastor John, myself and my wife have had the really the chance and, and the, the joy, the privilege um, to travel to every single one of our campuses um, and, uh, physically and, uh, and meet with members for some Q&A. And they've been great, honestly. They've been just so good. Um, and so now here we are on the last weekend uh, before a ballot goes out. Um, and I've been given the opportunity to talk about what the next chapter at Prairie Lakes might look like. Um, so no pressure, <laughs> right? Better be good. Better make it good. Uh, so, okay. So I've given this a lot of thought, um, a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer walks actually. And, uh, after all of that prayer, um, and all the thought and, and all the things that I feel like, you know, I, I, I could have talked about, um, here's where I'm landing. Okay. Here's next chapter of Prairie Lakes Church, um, which I'm very excited about, um, Here's what it could look like. It could look like um, 
pumpkins. <laughs> pumpkins. And as I say that, I can hear the poll numbers falling. Uh, right. Um, but so let me show you a picture. Let me show you a picture that will hopefully shed some light on why I'm talking about pumpkins on this weekend. Um, uh, maybe, maybe like our family, um, you get into a, uh, a rhythm every October um, because ever since we've had kids, part of our family tradition has been to head to the pumpkin patch every October. And we pick out some pumpkins, we bring them home and we carve them. And just some of our best family pictures kind of come out of this annual trip, you know? So like when our kids were small, there's little Jude, um, got a pumpkin on his head there. And then of course, little Ellie, when she kind of came back to the phones and we get some family pictures, you know? Now, so as the kids have gotten older, okay? Um, one thing's become increasingly apparent. Um, their mother, uh, my wife Erin, is a pretty, pretty good artist. And uh, um, turns out she's passed that ability on to both of our kids. And that's become apparent as we uh, continue to go. So, you know, they, they come with like cool designs, right? Um, so like my son kind of freehanded that one. And um, my daughter, I think, I can't remember, I think she maybe freehanded that, that one, you know. And, and uh, Aaron did that one. And, and you can tell which one I did. That's my hand. I just put my hand on a pumpkin and traced it and, <laughs> and cut it, okay? Because I, I am not a very good artist in that, <laughs> in that way. I, I am, am not good. And, and it's for this reason, my friends, that um, I like going to the pumpkin patch, but I, I, I hate, I hate, hate, hate carving pumpkins. I hate it so much because I'm so, so bad at it, right? And with each year, it only becomes more apparent, okay? They're, they're small, like, they, look at that. And then I, I did a T <laughs> for tink, right? That's the, <laughs> that's the extent. Um, and uh, it becomes more and more apparent each year. And I regress each year, which is, um, makes me kind of have a bad attitude just summed up in this next and final picture. That is my attitude, right? I would rather just cover it up and not do it, but my wife makes me do it. And I, I, um, I am who I am. Okay. Yeah, I am who I am. So, uh, <laughs> here's the question. What does my inability to carve pumpkins have anything to do, uh, with the next chapter of Prey Lakes Church, if anything at all, because my, oh my, there better be a connection and soon. All right. Uh, here is the lesson that I think runs underneath both. And that's this. I need, I need a pattern to follow. I do. I need a pattern to follow because when I try to do it on my own, as you can see, <laughs> I, I mess it up. I mess it up. And, uh, you know, in the spirit of transparency, even when I use a pattern on the pumpkin, it's not great but it's better than if I just freehand it. Uh, I need a pattern to follow. And pattern comes, patterns come in, in, in all shapes and sizes. Um, if you're a seamstress, you have a pattern. If you're a tool maker, you have a pattern. If you're an athlete, you're given some patterns. Someone has created a pattern for you to follow that does a couple of things. It takes most of the guesswork out of it and it takes a lot of the error out of it as well. That's what patterns do. Patterns are created for us, okay? Patterns are created for us so that as we follow them, uh, we can be confident that we're doing it like we're doing it right. Uh, that's, the, that's the beauty of them. And uh, you may be better at carving pumpkins than I am, but I don't think I'm alone in just needing a pattern. Um, in fact, in one way or another, I think all of us need, we all need patterns to follow, which is why God has created several of them um, for us to follow. And he's laid them down in scripture, uh, these patterns. So I've been a part of Prairie Lakes Church for, for 24 years now, almost to the day, actually, which is pretty crazy. Um, it was right after I graduated high school, which a lot of us are walking through that season with our kids right now, um, that I started attending. Um, in July of this year, I'll, I'll have been a full-time pastor here for 17 years. And I would say that over that time, over that time, 
I've seen several different iterations of what ministry looks like at Prairie Lakes with our name on the building. I've seen several different iterations, but whether it was 2003 or whether it's 2023, there have been some, some kind of God patterns uh, that we followed. Um, and we followed it in, in, in some of these patterns in almost every iteration of, of ministry. Um, and, and we followed these patterns imperfectly for sure, you know, um, but we follow, we've, we've, we've gone back to them time and time again. And, uh, and I'd also say from my vantage point that whenever we've deviated a little bit or drifted a little bit away from some of these patterns, um, it, it starts to become pretty apparent pretty quick. Uh, pretty obvious, kind of like the, the pumpkin carving that's obviously a little, <laughs> a little wonky. Uh, when, when we stop following these God patterns that he's laid out for us, we, we kind of just mess it up. Um, and you can tell. And, and, and then it's time to get back to following that, that pattern. So here's what I want to do. Um, as we look to the next potential chapter of Prairie Lakes Church, um, I want to talk about uh, three of these God patterns that we've tried to follow, and that I think in the next chapter we need to remain committed to. Three God patterns to follow in, uh, in the next chapter, okay? And I'm looking back and I'm looking forward. And I'm just seeing them. I want to share them with you. So here's number one. Here's number one. First God pattern that we're going to keep following in the next chapter. Number one is we need to keep out of trouble by keeping our focus. The pattern that I've watched us follow for a number of years now as we keep our focus on Jesus and his mission. We keep our focus on Jesus and his mission. And we're going to look at 2 Samuel 11 and 12. So um, go ahead and find that if you want to. It's in the um, first part of the Old Testament. We're going to have some of the verses on the screen here as well. It's important, like Pastor John has been reminding us the last couple of weeks, getting your eyes on Scripture, getting your eyes on God's Word. Um, it's where these patterns are, okay? So um, the passage we're going to be reading together, uh, chapters 11 and 12, um, these chapters document a part of the life of a man named David, who's a king of a nation uh, called Israel. And he's, he's one of Israel's, one of Israel's first and, and greatest kings. Um, you know, you may know him from the David and Goliath story. Prior to him being a king, he slays this giant. And then he eventually takes over for Saul, who was the previous king. And David has a ton of success um, as he succeeds Saul. Tons of success. And at the, at the time of his reign, Israel was still fighting with some of his neighbors, trying to establish the land and control over the land that God promised them. Um, and so that was the mission that God gave him. Go take this land and make it yours and, uh, and David was, was great at it. Uh, he fought battles and he won battles and he had faith and he just, he just kept going. He had a lot of success until in chapters 11 and 12, David takes his eyes, his focus off this mission. So let's pick up the story. Um, 2 Samuel 11 verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, uh, David sent Joab, who's the commander of the army, he sent Joab out with his men and the whole Israelite army, and they destroyed, they had success over the Ammonites, and they besieged a town called Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Okay, so there's the passage. Weather gets warm like it has been uh, back then. It's time to get back at it, you know. Um, we've got some ground to take, we've got some battles to fight, but. Oh, David's thinking, you know what? Oh, none of this is going to be real hard. I'm going to send Joab out. And uh, yeah, God's given us some marching orders. Still work to be done, but it's really nice outside. So, <laughs> and so here's what, here's what happens in verse two. One evening, David got up from his bed. Think about that. Okay. What is David doing in bed in the evening? Well, probably, probably David had a heck of a night before, probably, okay? Because we know he's hanging around when he should be at work. And uh, so he gets up one evening from his bed and he walks around the roof of his palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone out to find out about her. And the man said, her name's Bathsheba. She's the daughter of 
uh, Eliam, and he's the wife of he's the wife of or she is the the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So just track the story here. David first takes his eyes off the mission, and then because he shifts his focus, he starts focusing on something else, and pretty quickly finds himself some trouble. And if you don't know the story, how it goes, here's the Cliff Notes version. He summons Bathsheba to the palace, and uh, you're not going to refuse because he's the king. And David gets her pregnant. And uh, her husband, Uriah, is actually a soldier in, the, uh, in, in David's army. And he's not just any soldier. We learn this later on in the book. Uriah is kind of a special forces kind of guy. He's one of David's mightiest men. Um, I mean, and, and not only is Uriah risking his life in the war that David should, um, he's at the tip of the spear. And so David, uh, kind of finds himself in this predicament and he cooks up this plan to get Uriah back home on leave so that husband and wife can do husband and wife things and maybe explain this pregnancy. Um, of course that backfires. Uriah comes home, but he doesn't, he just doesn't. He can't believe that he's not in battle, and so he's not going to. And so what, what David ends up doing is he, he sends Uriah back to the front lines, but he sends Uriah with a secret note addressed to Joab, the commander-in-chief. And in the note, David tells Joab, put Uriah in a place where he is definitely going to get killed. David goes from being on mission with God successful to taking his focus off of that to adultery to a cover-up and then David becomes a murderer now that's a very extreme example right <laughs> right um I don't know that very many of us are worried about becoming a murderer if we take our focus off of God's mission for a second granted but just just before we give ourselves a pass here um, let's just remind ourselves of the mission that God gave us okay in Jesus uh, he, here it is here's the mission Jesus tells us to love God with everything we've got and he tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves and then before he leaves and he goes back up to heaven he says go and make disciples of all nation, nations, teaching them everything I've taught you, commanding them to do everything I've commanded you, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the mission, right? There, there it is. There's our marching orders. It's getting warm. Time to get back at it, right? I mean, if we were to use Prairie Lakes language to describe this same thing, here's how we talk about it. Our mission is to reach Iowa by launching no matter churches who launch no matter followers of Jesus. That's our mission. That's our vision. That's where we're going. That's why we exist. Okay. There's our marching orders. There's our mission. Um, when Jesus said all nations, he meant our part of the nation. Uh, he meant, uh, when, when Jesus talks about your neighbor, he meant you're my neighbor, right? He meant our part of little Iowa. Jesus is telling us, Hey, you got to love me by loving your part of little Iowa and your state and, and helping people step across this line of faith and, and become my disciples. Go love people into my family. That's the mission. That's our focus. Okay. Now, let me just ask you. If we were in the next chapter to take our focus off of that mission, even a little bit, What's at stake, do you think? Or maybe better put, if we take our focus off of that, who is at stake? Who's at stake? I mean, what if we take our focus off of that mission and instead put it on something like, I don't know, maybe what we don't feel like we have enough of? We're not thinking about the mission, but we're thinking about, well, do we have enough? Uh, do we have enough money? If we're going to keep launching campuses, do we have enough money? Campus number nine and 10, do we have enough? Um, it's a little risky. Or maybe we don't feel like we have enough time. We don't have enough time. It's too stressful. You know, um, I can't manage all of what I got going on, much less think about what someone else has got going on, much less think about a different town. You know, 
Um, but who's at stake? Who's at stake if we take our focus off of this mission? And, and the, the answer is this. It's, it's everyone who doesn't know just how far and how wide and how deep the love that God has for them in Jesus. They, they're at stake, right? I mean, it's their spouses and their kids. It's their grandkids and their coworkers. I mean, it's their, it's their town. Seriously. If God's given us this mission to reach Iowa, which he has, that's what's at stake if we if we take our focus off of that. I mean, what's going to happen in the next chapter if we decide that because John's maybe not in the driver's seat anymore or if we don't like the preaching as much <laughs> or if we would wish we'd talk less about politics or more about politics or less about sin or more about sin or less about culture or more about culture, you know? Whenever we decide to take our focus off of Jesus and his mission, and whatever we decide to put it on instead, that's when we're going to get ourselves in trouble. Time and time again, and I've got 24 years now that bears witness to this truth. When we stop following that pattern of keeping our focus on Jesus and on his mission, when we stop following that pattern, we start messing it up. We do. So if there's the next chapter coming for Prairie Lakes, if John ends up having a different title, if I end up having a different title, let me make this promise to you right now, okay? As best as I can, with God's help, for sure. We're going to keep our focus on Him. We're going to keep our focus on Jesus and on what He told us to do. If and when Jesus comes back, this is what he's going to find us doing. Amen? Okay. Real quick, before we move on from this pattern to number two, let me just point this out. And you can see it in David's story as well. And you're going to see it in ours if we shift our focus, okay? The mission might feel dangerous at some times. It, it might. But it's far more risky to get off mission. <laughs> I mean, God gave David a very dangerous mission. War is dangerous. People die. Really risky. But it ended up being far more dangerous for David and everyone else around him when he took his focus off of that mission and onto something else. It was. We, we, did, a, we did a series a while back that we called Safety Third. <laughs> kind of a tongue-in-cheek, you know, kind of wink, sarcastic title there. But the truth underneath that idea of Safety Third, the truth underneath it is this. Although it might feel safer to not take the risks that Jesus is calling us and telling us to take? To go love your neighbor, to go make disciples, to reach Iowa, to launch no matter campuses, that launch no matter followers. Although it might feel safer to just let off the gas a little bit, uh, ease back, maybe just let's just focus on getting healthier, you know? rather than just kind of keep our focus on where God's calling us to go, to trust Him, to stay obedient. You know, it's not, it's not safer to let off the gas. It's not safer to get off mission. It's not. The danger of taking our focus off of that mission far outweighs, outweighs the risk of staying on it, okay? Pattern number one, keep up to what keeping our focus on Jesus and His mission. Pattern number two, um, We've, we've done this imperfectly for sure, um, but we've done this. We've got we to keep on. We've got we to keep in step with God's Spirit. Okay? This one also comes out of uh, David's story, but a little earlier on, um, just, just a few chapters back, down to chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 1. Um, After the king, David was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him. He said to Nathan the prophet, uh, Here I am. I'm living in a house of cedar. David's built a palace. Um, and so I'm living in this palace while the ark of God, which is where God's presence at that time dwelt, the ark of God remains in a tent. Uh, Nathan replied to the king, oh, whatever you have in mind, David, go. Go ahead and do it. The Lord's with you. Okay. <laughs> so Nathan, Nathan's a prophet. And back then, here's what that meant. It meant he's the guy who can listen to God's voice. God spoke directly to him. And then that prophet's responsibility was to say to the king or whoever what God said. That's what a prophet was back then. 
And, uh, and so David has gone on this incredible run. He's winning battles. He's established his kingdom. He's built a palace. And he thinks to himself, how dare I sit in a house when God doesn't have a house? And he turns to the Nathan the prophet, which is what kings did. Nathan, what do you think? And by, by that, he's asking Nathan, Nathan, what do you think God thinks about it? Well, I think it's a great idea. And Nathan goes, look at all your past success. God's obviously been with you. And whatever you've done, he's going to be with you in this. He's going to love this idea, David. Now, nobody uh, technically asked God what he actually thought about that idea. I mean, no, no, nobody created any room for God to speak, which we talk about a lot. That's the pattern. Create room for God to speak. Create room for God to speak. Nobody really did. Nobody created any room for God to say, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Or, mm, I got some different ideas about that. And truthfully, they weren't going to hear either message because they weren't putting themselves in a position to hear anything. And the truth is, when you're not listening to God, when you're not listening to Him, you can't keep in step with Him. Now, because God is alive and a person, <laughs> uh, God speaks anyways. And he did to Nathan that very night. Uh, listen to this. Uh, that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, uh, saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I, I haven't dwelt in a house in the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. It's been in a tabernacle ever since they left Egypt. A tent. I've been moving from place to place, so the tent is my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, how come you haven't built me a house of cedar? <laughs> and so David and Nathan needed this reminder from God that we all need sometimes. And that is this. God's kind of saying, hey, I still speak. Even today. Even to even to you. See, we're not, we're not following instructions in an old book. Uh, we're not just looking at the last 20 years and saying, let's just keep doing that. We're not just resting on our past success. The, the reality is we can still hear God's voice and we can still and have to still keep in step with him today. Take a look at what he continues to say to Nathan. How, like, this is, this is what he wants the prophet to say. He says, now then, go tell this to my servant David. This is what the old Lord Almighty said. This is, these are my words. I took you from the pastor, David, pasture, from tending the flock and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been you, with you wherever you've gone and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. And now I, God's saying, I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. God has to remind these very well-intentioned but very out-of-step leaders. You are not in charge, really. You never have been in charge, really. And you never will be in charge, really. <laughs> and it's a good reminder, and this is what we mean, okay, when we talk about keeping in step. We don't want to just charge ahead and do whatever we think God wants. Now, we want to create room for Him to speak to us, to listen to His voice, and to follow His lead, to follow where He is going and what He is doing. We've been praying it at 525 every day for the last two months, remembering what Galatians 525 says. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. We keep in step. That's a pattern. We create room for God to speak to us. That's a pattern. We don't just go charging ahead and we don't lag behind. We've done this and we've got to continue to do this. We've got to keep in step. Number two. Okay, last one. As long as I've been a part of Prairie Lakes, um, I've, I've so appreciated and benefited from this and uh, something I'm very zealous to continue to protect. And, and that's this. We keep the main thing the main thing. We keep the main thing the main thing. 1 Corinthians 2 is where we're at, um, all the way at the other end of the Bible, um, about the middle of the New Testament. And it's an epistle. Okay, the Corinthians is an epistle, which is a letter written to a specific group of people for a specific purpose. 
And part of interpreting that correctly is you got to kind of know why is he writing this letter? Because you got to find out what's true back then before we apply it today. So it's written by a guy named Paul. Paul's a missionary. He's a church planter. He traveled a lot of the known world at that time, planting churches. And, and then as he moves on, he ends up writing these letters to these churches that he's planted to address some things that he's hearing about what's going on. And there's a bunch of things going on in the church, these group of churches that are in a huge city of, of Corinth. A lot of things going on. But one of the main issues, and maybe the core issue in Corinth, is what he starts talking about in the very first chapter of his first letter, and that is this. It's division. That's what's going on, and it's creating a lot of problems in those Corinthian churches. Now, if we were to use 2023 20, terms to describe it, it's tribalism. What was happening was this. There were groups of people in church in Corinth. There were groups of people in church who became more known for their tribe than their savior. Now in Corinth, one of the tribal divisions, so to speak, was, uh, was their favorite teaching pastor. I'm not kidding you. Because <laughs> uh, some of them were team Paul in chapter one. Some of them were team Apollo. And they were going at it on who they followed and who was better and why and, you know, so on and so forth. And so in chapter one, Paul, he confronts this. Paul's really blunt, which I really like. Um, he confronts this head on and he points out not only how stupid that was. And the reason Paul thinks that's a stupid thing to do is because he goes, uh, I, I, I plant seeds, Apollo waters seeds, you know, um, we teach stuff, but only God makes anything grow. Only God has the power to change anything, right? Um, so he goes, that's a really dumb thing to do, number one. But number two, he, he really starts to unpack, this is an anti-Christian thing to do, to be tribal, to be divisive over issues like this. Take a look at what he's going to say in the beginning of chapter two. Here's what he says. He goes, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, when I first planted your church, I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Only about Jesus and only about what Jesus did. That's it. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that and yeah, get this, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, so that your faith isn't resting on my preaching style or what I said or how I said it and whether you like me or not. No, 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 I don't want you attached to any of that. I want you attached to God's power. That's what Paul says. Now, if you don't know Paul's backstory, Paul was not a dumb guy. Uh, in fact, he was a biblical scholar before he became a follower of Jesus. He studied under one of the most uh, influential Pharisees of his day, a man named Gamaliel. Um, Paul didn't know a little. Paul knew a lot. But before Paul met Jesus, or better, better said, before Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus, um, here's what all of Paul's biblical knowledge led him to do. It led him to conclude that Jesus, his words, his ways, his teaching, and his followers were actually a threat to God's word, a threat to God's truth, a threat to everything he believed God taught. And so Paul was on a mission that he thought was from God. And his mission was this, to hunt down everyone associated with Jesus and eliminate them because they were a threat. Anybody that wasn't in his tribe, Paul was going to get after until Jesus literally knocks him off his donkey and says, stop it, no more. I am who I said I am, and from now on, instead of making people suffer for my name, you are going to suffer for my name. And Paul does this, actually. He does it joyfully, willingly, passionately, because he knows that this Jesus is the risen Son of God and that nothing, nothing, not the Ten Commandments, not the purity laws, not circumcision, not the Sabbath, not any of these things that have been in God's Word before Jesus came are anywhere near as important as Jesus himself and what he did. 
Which is exactly why later on in 1 Corinthians, he writes this in response to yet another division in the Corinthian church over whether it was okay to eat food sacrificed to idols, right? Here's what he says in 8.1. He says, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. The main thing is Jesus and his love expressed to us at the cross. This is first and greatest commandment. Love God by loving your neighbor. Love God by loving your neighbor. Jesus and his love and his command, right? Love God and love your neighbor. Love your neighbor whether they agree with you politically or not. Love your neighbor whether they agree with you morally or not. Love your neighbor whether they're nice to you or not. The one thing that binds us together, unifies us together as followers of Jesus, the one thing is love. Love lived out and expressed in exactly the same ways that Jesus modeled and taught. That's it. We are not allowed. We are not allowed to be divided over anything else. Divisiveness, divisiveness over non-essentials in this pattern is incompatible with following Jesus. Divisiveness over non-essentials is incompatible with following Jesus. Pralix is this beautiful place where a bunch of people gather under one roof to learn about Jesus, worship him, obey him, take steps of obedience in him. Um, and we've got people who are, you know, convicted that um, in, in a lot of different ways, you know, um, under that one roof, like maybe you should drink alcohol or maybe you shouldn't drink alcohol. We've got people on both sides of that. Um, we've got uh, people who support public schools and people who support private schools and people who do homeschools. We've got everybody like uh, there. We've got people who are lifelong Republicans. We've got people who are diehard Democrats. We've got that. Um, and while we are absolutely <laughs> allowed to hold a many and varied convictions about a lot of different things, we are not allowed to be divisive and form tribes over them. We have to keep the main thing, the main thing, three patterns, three patterns that we got to follow the next chapter, Prairie Lakes Church. I'm grateful to be able to talk to you about this, um, for us to keep on reaching Iowa in a way that a, a world is increasingly div divisive. We got, we got to stay true to these. We got to stay true to these. Let me pray for us. Father, thanks for a, a chance for, for us to be challenged and reminded from your word, for you for us to reflect back, God, on the faithfulness and the lessons you've taught us. Help us remain true to these as we continue to go. And regardless of what the next chapter of Pray Lakes Church looks like, continue to bless it. In Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. To steal a concept from Pastor Jesse, we just saw some of the importance of patterns in our lives. And, and that's one of the reasons that every month we celebrate communion. We operate in that pattern and that rhythm because it keeps us in a healthy spot. Uh, it allows us to look back and look forward. Communion is one of those meals that we get to uh, do together as believers. We get to look back on the finished work on the cross. And we get to look forward at life eternal because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. So if you are a believer, if you've stepped across the faith line, uh, this is a meal for us to uh, partake in together. So in Jesus' last supper with his disciples, uh, he took the bread. He said, this bread represents my body, which will be broken for you. And it was. So let's eat in remembrance. In the same way he took the cup, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. And it was, his body was broken, his blood was shed. So let's drink in remembrance. Let's pray. God, we are just grateful for this pattern, this meal of remembrance, uh, that we get to partake in together to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross, that while we were undeserving, he willingly paid the price. So we just thank you for that. Uh, we pray that as we leave here today, that you would encourage us in that, that you would help us to look back on the finished work and to look forward uh, to what is secured a life eternal for those who believe. 
So God, we're grateful for this time here today. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, we have some exciting stuff coming up here uh, for members at Prairie Lakes Church. If you are a member, uh, you'll be getting a ballot to vote. This is a monumental um, season for our church to vote on uh, the lead pastor uh, of Prairie Lakes Church, the next lead pastor. So you'll be getting a ballot if you are a member at Prairie Lakes Church. Be sure to vote. Um, if you um, haven't participated in one of our next chapter meetings, if you are a member, we'll have an online version this week that you should have received some communication on. Uh, so be sure to do that. And this is a final reminder, uh, 525, if you haven't been doing that, maybe you started strong and you've kind of let up Now's not the time to let up. 525 every day, a.m. or p.m. or both. Uh, set that alarm. Be praying for this next chapter uh, at Prairie Lakes Church. Because what we want to do is we want to be in step with the Spirit, not beside, not behind, not around. We want to be in step with the Spirit through this whole process. So 525, please be praying every single day. Uh, and kids, uh, you are up next. Children's ministry is about ready to begin. And everyone else will see you back next week.
Welcome to Story Lab. This week, we're talking about confidence, while we take a look at the story of some people who are waiting on an incredible gift. Hey, I'm Skylar. And I'm Sebastian. We're talking about confidence, which is living like you believe God is with you. Hey, what do you call a confident rabbit? Um, no idea. A hoptimus. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Get it? A rabbit hops, you know? Like. Yeah, all right, I get it. I think confident people tell more jokes. Well then, I don't have confidence in elevators anymore. Why not? They always seem like they're up to something, but they also let me down. Oh, that was awful. You gotta raise your joke game. I know, right? Total dad joke. I swear I got it. That makes sense. So, what are we doing today? Are you confident that I'm prepared? Yes. Well, today's story involves fire. It sure does. Flying fire. Yep. So that's what we're doing. Spot on. Wait, what? We're gonna create flying teabag rocket flames. That sounds like an 80s garage band. That's a great idea. Focus. Right, our flying tea bag rocket flame experiment. I'm not sure this is a good idea. Totally safe. I mean, if you're prepared. And have the help of a grown up. Where do we start? Let's make it. First off, make sure you are in an open area with no breeze. Step one cut off the top of a tea bag and empty out the tea. Step two unfold and straighten the tea bag. It should be a hollow cylinder, like this. Then set it on a metal or ceramic plate. We don't have a plate. But we do have a rotating lab table. Ooh, the metal top. Nice. Step three, using a lighter, light the top edge of this cylinder on fire. Now wait for it. Pretty cool, huh? Let's see it again. Why does this happen, you may ask? Heat from the fire causes the air molecules in the tea bag to become energized and move quickly up out of the bag. As the warm, less dense air rises, colder air moves in to replace it. This causes a thermal convection current to form, lifting up the tea bag. Can we try a bunch of them at once? Good thing I stockpiled tea. Ready? Mm-hmm. Wow. Now that's my kind of tea party. It's time for... The story before the story. Today, we're in the book of Acts, which tells us the story of the early church. But before Acts, way back in the very beginning, out of a deep, deep love, God made an amazing world. But when people turned away from God, the world was broken. God made a plan to draw people back into relationship. So at the right time, God sent Jesus, his very own son, to live among us. The religious leaders made plans to get rid of him. Jesus was crucified on a cross and died. On the third day, Jesus returned to life. Over 40 days, he appeared to more than 500 of his friends and followers. Then Jesus returned to heaven to be with God. He told his friends to wait for the gift of his Holy Spirit. Which is where our story starts. Take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Jen. 
After Jesus ascended to heaven, his friends returned to Jerusalem to wait for the Holy Spirit. But they didn't have a clear idea of what to expect. Jesus had promised to be with them always, and then he left. They just couldn't wrap their minds around what was supposed to happen next. For 10 days, they waited. Then, early one morning as the believers met to pray, something incredible happened. First, a sound like rising wind filled the room. Do you hear that? Sounds like a storm coming. But the trees outside aren't even moving, not even a breeze. Wait, what's this? Flames glowing appeared, hovering in the air. Then, as the Jesus followers watched in wonder, the fire separated into tongues of flame resting over each head. All of them were filled with God's Spirit. This must be what Jesus meant when he said we were going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Well, that is what Peter said. But it's very likely that instead of Aramaic, the language of the Jewish people living in Jerusalem, Peter spoke in a different language. This is extraordinary, spectacular, phenomenal. Well, that is what they said, but they said it in many different languages and dialects. God's Spirit had given his followers the ability to speak in new languages. It was pretty amazing, but it wasn't just some show trick. See, Jewish people from all over the world were gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks. It was a special time of celebration at the beginning of the wheat harvest. These men and women spoke probably in a dozen or more different languages. Some were Jewish by birth, but others were foreigners who had accepted the Jewish faith. And when Jesus' followers came out and started speaking, all these visitors began to hear about Jesus in their very own language. Aren't these people from Galilee? How on earth are they speaking in my language? I see people in this crowd from Parthia, Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Asia, Egypt, Rome. As far as I can tell, these Galileans have every language covered. What does all this mean? Not everyone took the believers seriously, though. They're just crazy. They're talking nonsense. Peter had always been a leader among the disciples, and he stepped up now to bring order to the chaos. My fellow Jews, we aren't speaking nonsense. The prophet Joel wrote, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Holy Spirit on all people. Peter went on to explain the entire story of Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth was a man who had God's approval. God did miracles, wonders, and signs among you through Jesus. You put Jesus to death, but God raised him from the dead. We are all witnesses of this. Jesus has been given a place of honor at the right hand of God. He has received the Holy Spirit from the Father. It is Jesus who has poured out what you now hear. God has made him both Lord and Messiah. These words had a deep effect on many in the crowd. What should we do? All of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then your sins will be forgiven. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to be baptized. Me too. Count me in. Everyone who accepted the message was baptized. That day, about 3,000 people joined the believers. The end. Wow, that's a lot of people. Can you imagine being there with the disciples and suddenly you see fire hanging in midair? And being able to speak another language just like that? Instant Duolingo. Remember how Jesus said he would be with his friends always, but then he returned to heaven. It didn't make sense to them until they experienced God's Holy Spirit at work. Now everyone, everywhere who believes in Jesus can rely on the power of God's Spirit for help. So, what's, what's our, our part in the story? When you choose to follow Jesus, God sends the Spirit to be with you, just like the Spirit was with the disciples. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you can love God and love others. You can live with confidence, knowing God's Spirit is present to help you when you're confused or afraid or angry or worn out. God's Spirit can give you wisdom, 
reminding you of Jesus' words when you need to make a tough choice. When you just aren't sure you've got what it takes, God's Holy Spirit can help you do the right thing. And when you start asking for help and listening to the prompting of God's Spirit, your life will begin to change. You have the ability to live your days with more love, joy, and peace. You'll begin to act with more patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness. And you can start to show more self-control too. You can ask God to respond when your little sister is driving you nuts. Or when you feel frozen on a test. Or when you just feel really sad. So basically any time. God's Spirit is the most amazing gift ever. Just think about it. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives inside us. That should give you some serious confidence. For sure. See you all next time. So here's the thing. God sent His Holy Spirit to help you. Anytime, anywhere. Let's host to that. Ooh, what are you drinking? All the tea we emptied out. Makes sense. Thanks for joining us in the Story Lab. See, See you, you next time. time.